Christina. Um, I'm with Real, and today I want to talk to you guys about love. So what does love have to do with law and social change? It might seem like a non sequitur. And that's exactly why I want to talk about it today. See, I came to HLS because I am passionate about social change. And since coming here, I've had a lot of conversations with smart, creative, experienced students and professors alike about law and social change. And over time, I realized that there is something important missing from these conversations. And that is the word love. I think it's safe to say that all of us value love. We know it's a powerful force. Hopefully, we've all experienced its life-giving impact. But we don't like using that word when we talk about law and social change. It's too fluffy. It's too difficult to define or agree on a definition. It's impossible to implement on a large scale. And so we develop this kind of split personality about love, where we deeply value it on a personal level, but kind of shove it in the corner when we put on a public policy hat. And we'll study law, economics, sociology, politics, history, even moral philosophy, but no one ever talks about studying love. And yet, the people we admire most, the people who've changed history the way we dream of changing history, Martin Luther King Jr., Nelson Mandela, Gandhi, Mother Teresa, they talked about love all the time. If we want to change the world, why are we exiling this word from our social change discourse? Now before I go on, let me specify what I mean when I say love. To love someone is to do three things. Number one, believe they are capable of thriving. Number two, commit to that thriving. And number three, stay committed, even in the face of hardship and self-sacrifice. Let me also specify what I don't mean. For the purposes of this talk, love does not mean affection or a personal emotional investment. I'm focusing on love as a vital perspective through which to discuss and craft large-scale social change. So why is it important to talk about love in the context of law, law and public policy and social change? Well, let's consider the alternatives. If our public policies and our laws are not shaped by love, they will be shaped by detached concern at best and fear or hatred at worst. But most of the time, they will be shaped by some kind of dehumanizing or objectifying or counterproductive economic theory. We can find lots of examples of detached concern in our public policies regarding poverty. Take, for example, food stamps. With food stamps, you can buy produce at the grocery store, but you can't buy food that's hot when you buy it. So if you're too tired or you're too busy to cook, you can buy a frozen dinner, but you can't buy a roasted chicken. And these rules are in place because we want to incentivize poor people to be frugal in their spending habits, and we don't want to make food stamps too appealing. And in the process, we've built a lack of dignity into the system. It's as if we said to ourselves, well, we don't want people to starve, so how can we get rid of this problem as efficiently as possible? And this attitude is rampant in the criminal justice system. I saw it while working at Roxbury District Court last semester. Homeless people charged with trespassing on benches. Drug addicts tossed into jail to detox, only to end up back on the streets to repeat the whole process. I felt like I was observing a waste management system not a justice system. But I also saw powerful examples of why it doesn't have to be that way. My first client was a heroin addict. When I met her, she was going through withdrawals. She was shaking, nauseated. I had never talked to a more desperate person in my life. Normally, somebody in her position would have just gone to jail. But that day, something different happened. Instead of going to jail, she got to go to rehab. And as of today, she's been clean for 185 days. She's living with her kids again. She's looking for a job. And if it wasn't for her determination to go to rehab, and if it hadn't been for the people who fought for her to go, she would have just gone to jail. Because the criminal justice system doesn't believe that criminal defendants are capable of thriving. It doesn't commit itself to that thriving, even in the face of hardship and self-sacrifice. It's not based on love. 
Now, the people who put these policies in place had research, they had economists, they had political power, even good intentions. But I'm willing to bet all of my student loans <laughs> that they didn't talk about love. And that should be a warning to us that if all we focus on is better research, better economic solutions, better technology, then even with the best of intentions, we are not going to do much better than our predecessors. Prime example of this, last semester at the Harvard School of Education, a professor gave a lecture on a project she had participated in called the Moving to Opportunity Experiment. This project tracked the academic progress of kids living in public housing. And it found that the reason why these kids were doing poorly in school is because their neighborhoods were bad. They were chaotic. They were causing these kids to give up and get in trouble. And so the team heading this project secured the funding to physically move these students to private apartments in neighborhoods with lower poverty rates because all of the data showed that this would work. And they did it. They actually succeeded in moving these students and their families to new neighborhoods. And they were expecting to see substantial changes, and nothing happened. And after she said this to the class, this professor broke down in tears. This research team had the best of intentions. They poured so much of their lives into trying to solve this problem, and it didn't work. Because what these kids needed was not just a new neighborhood. It wasn't just more resources and opportunities. It was love. These kids needed people who would believe in them, who would commit themselves to their thriving, and who would stay committed, even in the face of hardship and self-sacrifice. A new neighborhood is a good start. But what we need is love. The thing about love is that it's equipped for messiness. Social injustice is very messy. It's complicated. It's immune to quick fixes. But any type of social change mechanism that does not account for love is just that, a quick fix. If we truly want to change the world the way Martin Luther King Jr. did, the way Nelson Mandela and Gandhi and Mother Teresa did, we must not succumb to the temptation for a quick fix. We must be willing to wade into the messiness of injustice armed with love. We have to give love a place at the public policy table. And we can start by rejecting the stigma attached to the word love in our academic discussions here at Harvard. So hopefully by now you're all thinking, yes, we need love-based public policy. Sign me up. But what does that look like? Food stamps for hot food, uh, more funding for rehab programs, more mentors for kids in poor neighborhoods. But my purpose today is not to supply a brand new slew of policy ideas. It's to get us to realize that first, we need to bring love into our discussions about public policy. But second, in order for those discussions to be productive, we have to explore how to love much more deeply. We need to study love. If we're going to understand love well enough to start incorporating into our public policy, we're going to need a lot more than three bullet points in a 10-minute talk. It's going to take time. We're so used to a, a mindset toward public policy that sees problems, crime, poverty, education, and it seeks to make those problems go away. But love-based public policy sees people, and its goal is to honor those people. What if we all made it our goal to study love and social change just as much as we study law and social change, economics and social change, politics, history, sociology, and social change? Here's my contribution from 1 Corinthians 13. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It's not rude. It's not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, 
always perseveres. Love never fails. <laughs>